Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, apologies for uh, Harsh will admit we are a 5,000 year old civilization and what's a few minutes here and there. Uh, we are here with a very distinguished panel to discuss uh, a very important book that uh, records a very important event and, uh, in a sense, an ongoing event, not just a single event which that ended last year. We are here to discuss Radeep Sardesai's uh, The Election That Changed India. Radeep is to my right. He's a distinguished journalist and television personality. Uh, this is, I gather, his first book. Uh, it's, it's on the election of 2014, the election Mr. Narendra Modi and the BJP won. But in a sense, it describes a, a democratic and electoral trend that continues into 2015. And I think Rajdeep uh, has said, suggested that in, in other discussions. Uh, we'll begin with Rajdeep speaking about the book and the book's essential hypothesis and whether it's still valid or whether it's been, whether it's been renewed by the Delhi elections of 2015. Following which, we'll have uh, uh, interventions by three discussants. Uh, to my left is Mihir Sharma, opinion editor at the Business Standard, and a distinguished and recent author in his own right, having written a book called Restart on the Indian Economy, which in a sense uh, is a prequel, if I could use that word, to Rajdeep's work, because the economic conditions uh, that prompted Mihir's book ended up influencing the election and its, and its mandate. Uh, to Rajdeep's right, uh, uh, in terms of direction rather than politics, uh, is uh, uh, Har Sethi, who is a uh, scholar and consulting editor to the Seminar Magazine and has made many thoughtful interventions on Indian society and politics. And finally, uh, uh, si sitting right here next to me is uh, Dr. Manoj Joshi, who is a, a senior writer, journalist, uh, fellow at the Observer Research Foundation and an authority on uh, defense and strategic uh, uh, an, uh, analysis in, in the Indian context. So we begin with Rajdeep and then move uh, to maybe Harsh, Mihir, and then Manoj. Rajdeep, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, and it's a uh, it's a great pleasure to to be here. Uh, big thank you to Samir for organizing this and uh, giving me this opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, let me at the outset make one small correction, which was that. I actually attempted, along with a few fellow journalists, to write a book in 92, 93 on the Mumbai riots, uh, which took place at the time of, uh, it was called When Bombay Burnt. Unfortunately, I wasn't in television in those days, so no one read the book. <laughs> or, 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 or very few people read the book, or it perhaps reflects the state of publishing in, in the early 90s. UBS put out one edition and then it just disappeared. But it's a, I, we'd like to think that's an important book in the context of what happened in, in those two uh, uh, rather traumatic years of 92-93. Uh, but, uh, in a sense, uh, this 2014 uh, is, is just as important as what happened in the early 90s. And ironically, there's a continuum between what happened in those early 90s and 2014, uh, particularly in the persona of Narendra Modi, in a strange way. The first time I met Narendra Modi was 1990, which was uh, the Rath Yatra. Uh, where he was in charge of the Gujarat leg of it. And that Rath Yatra, in a sense, led to the demolition of the Babri Masjid, which led to the riots, which led to the blasts. And many of them believe that that was the period which led to the rise of the BJP, which came to power, of course, first time in 96. And what we've seen in 2014 is a culmination of this, uh, of, of this journey, which the BJP has undertaken and which Mr. Modi, has, uh, has undertaken. So purely from a journalistic point of view, uh, it's been fascinating to observe. And frankly, uh, this book is more in that nature. It, it's a narrative. It's, it's written as a story. I was, uh, particularly since the central character was Mr. Modi and given uh, the nature of relationship that I've had with him over the years, some good, some bad, uh, I thought I must try to whatever extent keep my opinion out of it. And particularly in the context of the 2002 Gujarat riots, which again were, was, a, was a defining moment, an, an event in a sense which propelled Mr. Modi uh, from being just another BJP leader uh, into an iconic figure, particularly for his rank and file. And, and I would like to believe that one of the more interesting aspects of this book and indeed of Mr. Modi's career is to, is to look at Mr. Modi in the 1990s and look at his evolution then post-2002 to the point where in 2014 or 2015 that we are now, he's a bit like the film star Amitabh Bachchan was in Bollywood in, uh, in the late 1970s where he's number one to ten and then you're looking for leader number eleven. Uh, the fact is that he is this preeminent figure. My attempt in the specific context of this election was to then see how 
does someone like him who post 2002 becomes a polarizing figure then evolve into seemingly uh, a cementing figure seemingly this pro governance uh, guru uh, and 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 suddenly is in the best position to capitalize on the decline in the congress i've said this before and i believe this that mr modi was simply there at the right place at the right time in the right context i think given what had happened in india between 29 and 14 uh, a declining economy in particular and i think mihir mihir's book is a wonderful exposition of all the mistakes that were made in that period particularly uh, a declining economy uh, for whatever reason global or domestic a political leadership which was seen to be weak and silent uh, a congress party which was struggling to come to terms with coalition pressures found itself in one scam after the other this was a country which was desperately looking for an arnold schwarzenegger like leader and narendra modi with his chappan ki chhati or the 56 inch chest which he doesn't possess but claims he does uh, uh, was perfectly positioned to capitalize on what was seen to be a soft declining congress leadership and was able to successfully project a gujarat model uh, as the ideal for the rest of the country one of the more interesting uh, 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 speeches that i heard mr modi was somewhere in up uh, one of his speeches in up where he constantly referred to gujarat and contrasted it with up and i was sitting with a few uh, 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 people in the back of the of the rally who said that some of their relatives used to work in surat and they said you know wahat bijli uh, uh, you know you get power 24 by 7 and look at up we hardly get any power and modi had been successful in making gujarat out to be a land of milk and honey and the congress instead of trying to question that Gujarat model, chose to battle Mr. Modi on familiar terrain of 2002, saying that he's this polarizing figure, he's a basmasur, who's whatever he touches will be destroyed, he's a divisive figure, rather than challenging Modi on what should have been the debate of 2014, telling people, as they now try to tell people, that look, actually our governance model is better than yours. So rather than make the election about governance, it became at one level about Modi himself and that the moment the election became about Mr. Narendra Modi the personality the Congress was trapped because India was looking for a strong personality in the, the fact was that Narendra Modi needs to send a big thank you card to Rahul Gandhi and Manmohan Singh I mean without Manmohan Singh being the silent Prime Minister that he was particularly post 2011 and I believe that somewhere in his second term Mr. Manmohan Singh lost his mojo whether it was the fact that he'd had another bypass whether it was the fact that when he made an attempt to reach out to Pakistan right at the start of his tenure in 2009 his party pulled him back Manmohan Singh simply went comatose through large parts of his second term so therefore Mr. Modi became the perfect person to occupy that space and interestingly for an Indian chief minister to be able to achieve that national image is one of the more fascinating journeys of, of a politician and I think Mr. Modi had those skills he had oratorial skills he had the communication skills and interestingly and maybe Ashok will be able to tell us more about this Mr. Modi was very successful in targeting that younger India that younger more impatient India his first speech in a sense to signal his arrival on the national stage took place in this city in February 2013 when he goes to Sriram College of Commerce and speaks about the Gujarat model of governance. And this is to a generation which has absolutely no memory of 2002. This is a generation which must have been seven, eight years old in 2002, but was now the first generation voter. And in fact, the CSDS post poll survey shows that in the age group between 18 and 23, the BJP got 37% of the vote, the Congress got 17% of the vote. And this is nationwide. If you only look at the, the, the real catchment area of the BJP, which was Western, Central and Northern India, I'm sure that the number will be much, much higher. In fact, one of the more fascinating aspects of this election is the BJP's remarkable strike rate. Because if, that, if you look at their 282 seats, they really come out of a catchment area of 350. In that sense, 
Mr. Modi's victory is no different to what Kejriwal achieves on a much smaller scale in Delhi. 67 out of 70 is seen as a dominant victory, but so is Modi 282 really out of 350. And the parallels that you can draw between what happened in, in the Lok Sabha and what happened in Delhi are very straight. Much like in, in, in 2014, May, India was looking for a strong leader. In 2015, February, Delhi was looking for a strong leader. And it brings us to the question, are Indian elections, despite 543 constituencies, becoming increasingly quasi-presidential? Is it important to have those strong figures that you are going to project? Is your party system now so weakened? Are you ideologically at the end of the day not so different that you are going to somewhere have to sense your USP or your X factor will be the leadership question. Now the Congress recognized this but recognized it much too late. Rahul Gandhi suddenly steps into the fray in January 2014 and let's be clear. Rahul had no administrative experience. Rahul had limited political experience. And as I say in the book, Rahul never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. In my view, Rahul Gandhi, if he really wanted to contest the 2014 elections as the Congress's so-called prime ministerial candidate, should have taken charge in 2012. In 2012, the Congress should have asked Manmohan Singh, in a sense, to gracefully exit. We perhaps wouldn't even have seen the day that we are seeing today, where the prime minister stands accused. An honest man, in, in a sense, at least as far as his personal financial integrity, suffers the ignominy of being accused in the coal scam. Now, I know that the coal scam dates back to UPA 1. But the fact is, in 2012, the Congress had enormous opportunity. And there was still a reservoir of goodwill that existed for the party and then for Rahul Gandhi to seize the opportunity. But he did not. He did not seize it then. He did not choose to break Anna Hazare's fast. He did not choose to get involved in the protests for women's security, which took place in the national capital. He simply at no stage took ministerial responsibility. In fact, there were a group of uh, his well-wishers who went apparently and met him in 2010 and told him to become the Rural Development Minister or become the HRD Minister. And Rahul said, no, I can't. I'm going to be focused on party organization. Mm -hmm. The fact is we are in 2015, he's still focusing on party organization. But he's doing it by taking a leave of absence mm -hmm. and introspecting. Now, all this introspection should have taken place in 2010-11 and he should have been in a position to take on Mr. Modi. By contrast... My belief, in, and this is one of my th broad theses in the book, is that in 29 itself, when Advani lost that election, Mr. Modi sensed his opportunity. This was not something that was planned in a sense only in 2012 or 2013 when he came to Delhi. Mr. Modi had a five, six year plan where he saw Delhi as a potential target for him. And in fact, the one moment that Mr. Modi was worried, in my view, in this entire five-year period was 2012 Gujarat elections. Because the 2012 Gujarat elections were really a big test for Mr. Modi. The state had suffered a major drought. There was severe anti-incumbency against his MLAs. But the Congress, instead of taking on Mr. Modi in Gujarat, gave up Gujarat. They virtually thought that in Gujarat, we can't defeat Modi. I remember speaking to Mr. someone close to Mr. Modi and he said they had actually internal polls which suggested a very close fight at that moment in October 2012. But the Congress gave it up. They vacated that space in Gujarat. That victory in Gujarat in, in December 2012 made Modi a three-time chief minister. And a three-time chief minister at a time when the BJP was suffering from a leadership vacuum enabled him, propelled him to the position where eventually in 2014, he became the prime ministerial candidate and the prime minister of India. As I said in Delhi, the in, in the 12 months later, and I'll sort of just briefly look at that, in the 12 months since this, or six months since this book has been written, what has happened? We've seen, has India changed? I would say we are on pause button, given what particularly the budget has shown and given the fact that the government has, Modi has moved incrementally. I think a number of people, Modi supporters would like Modi to move much faster. I think Mr. Modi is very conscious of the fact, and we've seen that in Gujarat as well, that he believes in sort of the long, what we call in Hindi, lamba race ka ghoda, the long run. You know, he doesn't believe in, 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 in sort, of, sort of upsetting the status quo within a month. My sense is Modi sees this as a 10-year project that he's on. So it's very clear that he's moving incrementally rather than radically. What we've also seen is that he is capable of suffering from the same disease as every Indian politician is, which is an element of complacency and arrogance. And I think there was a measure of both in their defeat in Delhi. 
in the belief that they could, you know, simply Mr. Modi's face would be enough to project them and propel them to victory in Delhi. The fact was Delhi was, and Kejriwal played this brilliantly. He said Modi for PM, Kejriwal for CM. That was the subtext of the Aam Aadmi Party's message. And if the, if, the Congress, if the BJP had a core constituency in the 2014 elections, which was the Hindu middle class constituency that they had in 2014 and incrementally added new groups, particularly the young, in Delhi, Kejriwal had the lower income orders. The CSDS post poll survey shows 65% of those of poor and lower income voted for the Aam Aadmi Party, 23% for the, for the BJP. Now, in a city-state like Delhi with large slum clusters, that made a huge difference. But the fact is that Kejriwal was able to again convert, much like Modi was able to convert 2014 into a presidential contest, 2012 into a president, uh, 2015 Delhi into a presidential contest. It's also very clear that the sense of impatience and anger of the average voter in India is growing all the time. Let's be clear. Even if Mr. Modi was not there, the BJP would have still got 200 seats in the Lok Sabha elections because people wanted the Congress out. I think Mr. Modi's great achievement was to take the BJP from 200 to 280. That 80 seats was where the media played a role. The 80 seats was the wonderful micromanagement that the BJP was able to do using social media, using uh, a, a sense of, uh, of, of, of the RSS network. I mean, the wonder, you know, the, 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 one of the revelations for me was the, the manner in which the RSS used the, the Panna Pramuk or someone who has one page of an electoral roll of 16 names. And for three months, each Panna Pramuk was asked to target just one page. And that happened across Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous and indeed most important state. So if the BJP hadn't got those 70 odd seats in UP, it would have been a more conventional kind of election where the BJP would have been around 200, 210 and then dependent on allies. Modi's great achievement, I think, was to be able to propel the BJP from 200 to 280. Kejriwal's significant achievement was to propel the Aam Aadmi Party from a party which would be 30, 35 seats to 67 seats. And I think that is where increasingly political parties are going to have to now change the way they do their politics. Politics is not going to be fought on ideology because increasingly the Congress looks like the BJP and the BJP in some ways also looks like the Congress. The Jandhan Yojana of Mr. Modi is a borrowing of the Congress. The Swaj Bharat is very much part of Nirbal, uh, you know, the, 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 the Nirmal uh, uh, Abhiyan of the Congress that, that the Congress had. So the, 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 the difference, the X factor has to be your ability to either target specific groups, as Modi did with a younger India, I believe, in the 2014 election, or as Kejriwal did by adding to that lower income group of his, increasingly a younger India. I was interested, for example, that one of the... In going to one Kejriwal rally, the highest applause that Kejriwal got, and this was in outer Delhi, was when he promised free Wi-Fi. And suddenly you had all these young jarts clapping away. Because everybody wants a smartphone. And everybody, when they want a smartphone, wants a smartphone where they can prefer, preferably have free Wi-Fi. And I don't think Rahul Gandhi would have even thought of that. Because Rahul Gandhi is practicing the politics of an old one, unless he's come back from his leave of absence and now introspects and believes there's a new Congress out there. But this is a new India. This is an India where you've got to constantly communicate. You've got to constantly engage. You know, one of the mysteries that I wanted to solve in this book was to find out why Rahul Gandhi is not on social media. Why is he not on Twitter and Facebook? And I was told Rahul likes direct communication. And I asked, what is direct communication? They said, you know, Rahul can't be engaging with one lakh followers on Twitter. Talk. He would like to talk to each individual. Now, it isn't about that. It's about the messaging. It's about the optics. It's about being seen. Today's Modi's picture is classic Modi. Modi taking a selfie in Seychelles. He's trying to send out the message, look, I'm just like you. All of us want to take selfies. I'm the Prime Minister, I want to take a selfie. I don't think Rahul Gandhi would do that. Manmohan Singh certainly would not do that. <laughs> but Kejriwal might. I can be, I wouldn't be surprised if Kejriwal returns from Delhi and his, his Aam Aadmi Party supporters will have various pictures of him at the naturopathy clinic in Bangalore doing yoga or whatever. You see, you want to create this impression of a new kind of leader, much more touchy-feely, much more communicative, much more stronger, decisive. Both are high commands. In fact, the similarities between Kejriwal and Modi are astounding. The only difference is that the AAP is even more chaotic possibly than the BJP because the BJP has been there longer. So there's an organizational base that enables it to endure. 
but i could have otherwise seen the you know I, mr modi was able to pack off his older generation into a mark darshak mandal aam aadmi party doesn't have a mark darshak mandal so they are probably going to be expelled but the fact is it's a very much a high command culture kind of authoritarian politics which conveys the impression of being decisive leaders and i'm just wondering whether as a country we are increasingly moving towards that and therefore over the next 5 10 years particularly with the economic challenges that india faces at state levels also india's chief ministers are more and more autocratic i mean i'm trying to think of one chief minister who is truly democratic le- who is left in this country it's very very difficult to point out you know this guy actually carries everyone along with him you know he actually has a democratic decision making process within the party they are becoming fewer and fewer which is part why we have so few congress chief ministers because they look still to their party high command in delhi for instructions the bjp has been much more successful in that sense and modi is a product of that of empowering your chief ministers and giving them the sense that they are their own high command so i think these are the factors i know harish khare has written a book on the 2014 election where he seems to think that this is increasing an election which was about the hindu vote and maybe in a in a state like bihar you could argue where the upper caste consolidated around modi but look the scale of this victory does not suggest that the scale of this victory suggests it was voter anger plus a desire to have a strong leader as simple as that and the economy is stupid i mean i think chidambaram when he told me in an interview said look if we were growing at 8% if we were growing at 10% forget corruption forget everything else forget modi we would have won the election or we would have certainly been in the race but once you are growing at 4% and you have double digit inflation for three consecutive years you don't have a chance and that's exactly what happened in this election and mr modi was there at the right place at the right time and 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 in a sense i think that now is the opportunity and he has this next 5 10 years if he's really on this 10 year project of his to show whether he can actually change the political discourse of this country and i think the jury is out on that because as we've seen there are mixed signals there are signals which suggest that there is a there is a fringe element i mean i think the fringe element in the bjp has probably read harish khare's book so they think that they have they, the victory is theirs when it isn't and they and i don't call them the fringe because the rss is certainly not the fringe but they believe it's their victory or a section of them believes it's their victory the fact is it's not their victory it's a victory for in the belief that mr modi much like a tony blair in the united kingdom has created a new bjp has pushed the bjp towards the political center i think that's the interesting thing about what's happened in kashmir i mean you know the fact is nobody can believe that narendra modi has chosen to take the initiative and i believe it is the prime minister's initiative that has led to this i mean left to the party i do not believe that they would have gone with a tie up with pdp mr nirmal singh has nothing in common with mufti mohammad said both sartorially and in any other way <laughs> and one of the more interesting things about that that kashmir uh, swearing in was you know someone was uh, taking a oath in the name of allah and someone was saying jai shri ram and frankly you know it is mr modi's conscious attempt i believe to push his party towards the political center now whether he will succeed as we see there will be resistance he could well fail in the exercise but it is a risk that he has taken and i think it is a risk which if he is able to succeed in guarantees him 10 years in power the threat really to mr modi i believe looking ahead doesn't come from outside it comes from within it's the battle within he has to resolve his battle within outside the congress is in disarray and i you know in my epilogue which i'm now rewriting for a for another version given what has happened in delhi and what has happened to rahul gandhi my sense is that the congress is in no position to recover and if anything that space which the congress is vacating is being taken by other parties by nitish and lalu possibly in bihar by arvin kejriwal in delhi by mamta in bengal that the battle will be fought on you know between the bjp and these parties at least in the next 5 years so mr modi has a huge opportunity to really redefine in a sense the national discourse and maybe redefine how we see him or how people like me have seen him and i've been sort of in in conclusion i i do believe that this election has you know researching this book and writing about it i, I was pleasantly surprised by the manner in which mr modi has reinvented himself he seems wonderful with young people like ashok malik young he seems <laughs> he seems and you know talking to them listening to them he's very good every young person that i spoke to who had been involved in the modi campaign in some way or the other was completely bowled over everyone in his age group was believes that the man is totally insecure and is out to destroy us 
And everyone older than him believes that Modi has no respect for us and is pushing us into retirement. So it's almost as if Mr. Modi is most comfortable with people under the age of 30. So I won't include you in that. But he's and I and and the young and the young nature of many of his event managers who are able to be virtual impresarios, creating 3D with around Modi, creating these uh, missed calls where you could become a BJP member. I mean, they they were they were you know they they were stretching the boundaries of what of technology using technology and Modi himself is very good. You know, it actually seems to have a admiration for all these young kids who have these te these technology skills. And for an RSS Pracharak to have been able to achieve, you know, to, to have been able to make that transition is quite remarkable in a way. So, I, you know, I, the jury is out on whether Mr. Modi will, uh, uh, you know, be able to, in a sense, take forward what this mandate of 2014 or whether he will himself be destroyed or already undermined. I wouldn't say the word destroyed, undermined uh, by the party that he leads and the nature of the party that he leads. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rajiv. That was a, a, a quick sort of run through the last five years, really, of Indian politics from 2011 to 2015. I'd now move to the first of our three discussions. Uh, and after they've spoken, we'll move to, we'll invite interventions from the audience and questions for Rajiv or anybody else. Uh, Mr. Sethi, would you like to start? Uh, Rajiv's made two interesting points. He says, in a sense, uh, Mr. Modi moved the BJP to the center and out Congress the Congress. And then, uh, perhaps paradoxically, uh, Mr. Kejriwal out Modi Modi in Delhi. Is this about personality or is it something more than personality? Okay. Is this our underlying social trend? I have pressed the button. Mm. You know, Rajdeep, as the experienced TV, <coughs> anchor is a difficult act to follow. I mean, uh, I'd always earlier believed that Rajdeep writes better than he speaks. But that's partly because, uh, like Modi's constituency, you know, I'm part of that lot which has been shoved to the sideline. I'm over 60. Uh, but let me respond to a range of things. I mean, when the book came out, I read it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, but then I've enjoyed a lot of his writing. Uh, uh, like all characters who spend some time doing research, fortunately many years back, you know, I have this funny idea saying, you shouldn't be commenting on momentous events rather rapidly. Let time go by and then assessments change. So my first real query for myself was, is this a book too fast? Is this a quickie? Uh, now, we are all smart fellows these days. So we say that we are analysts, but you know, Rajdeep has this double head of being both a commentator and a reporter. And from reporters, we want the quick news. From commentators and analysts, we are looking for the long dury uh, kind of thing. And part of the success of the book lies in the ability to be able to manage both. But that now, that's just minimal stylistics. There's a second stylistic issue that I want to raise. Is 2014 the election that changed India? Or does 2014 represent a picture of an India that has changed? And I'm saying uh, this is not mere wordplay. Uh, if you look at Rajdeep's presentation even today, uh, uh, there is a process that he's trying to trace from the last 20 years or more, from the early 90s to the middle of this decade. And saying that there are certain shifts that have been taking place, and the nature of the parties, the nature of the electoral contestation, the manner within which we understand uh, electoral democracy in the country has been changing, but many of the players have been unable to understand that. Now, this is in part an issue of demography. It's partly, uh, to use his phrase, it's the economy stupid. It's the change in the manner in which people are generating wealth or income for themselves. Uh, there is a phrase which I find insufficiently used in the analysis of Indian electoral landscapes, which is migration. You know, I mean, for 
as long as when I was a student and even earlier as a researcher, you know, the dominant image was India as country living in villages. Uh, we never quite understood this funny thing called the city. Uh, the city uh, was in any case in elections, it didn't matter. All right. Uh, but what we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years is not just migration, uh, the change in the nature of occupations, uh, demography, and that is what links to aspirations and, and, and things of that kind. And the mobility of people changes many things. It changes the manner within which we looked at roots. It changes in the manner in which we looked at caste and caste calculations. It's the manner within which we looked at community identity formations. All right. And I think that what this does, along with shifts in technologies of communication, both television, which is a broadcast technology, talking down and creating a certain kind of national culture, and this funny thing called the mobile, all right, I think dramatically changes the manner within which people interact with each other. And therefore, all the things which are, Rajdeep's book is replete with interesting stuff in terms of reworking the nature of electoral strategies, electoral management, etc., etc. Uh, the RSS Karikarta is Ram Madhav an RSS Karikarta with a fancy watch, with a fancy phone, uh, you know, the ability to be able to reach out to NRI professionals all over the world, or is he the kind of RSS Karikarta that we imagined when we were younger, of the fellow who's there in the community attending weddings and funerals and ensuring ki bhai, you know, all the drains are clean. And, you know, this is a very different kind of world. That's the second general point that I want to make. There is a third general point that I want to make, which is that, again, if you look at almost all post-colonial states and even otherwise, there has been this general rise of cultural majoritarianism. I mean, you know, I mean, Japan was not an erstwhile colonized state. You look at Malaysia, you look at Sri Lanka under Rajapaksa, uh, you look at India, you go all the way to Turkey. And I'm saying there is another kind of cultural politics being played out where the first generation of the post-colonial elite, which the BJP very successfully sought to demonize as deracinated, westernized intellectuals, Nehruvian elite, pseudo-secular, I mean, all the kind of appellations that we've heard playing out becomes crucial in feeding into both the insecurity and the aspiration of a range of people who felt that the Indian systems were not giving them adequate space for upward mobility. And I'm saying this, you've seen everywhere, the rise of Ahmad Jinnad in, in Iran or the politics of Erdogan in Turkey is, is very much that. And cultural majoritarianism can very easily marry with economic aspirations and globalization. I mean, the same Erdogan who will play Islamist politics of one kind in Turkey will also seek to steer his country into the European Union. All right? And I'm saying that this earlier polarity that existed in many of our minds between if you are one kind, then you must be backward looking, you must be anti-technology, you must be anti-markets, you must be the Swadeshi Jagran Manch. All right. So the Swadeshi Jagran Manch and, you know, I'm against cow slaughter and I'm for Ram Mandir seem to us to be a fit. But seeing the other kinds is, is, is the funny thing. That's the third. There's a fourth point which I would like to. Uh, Rajdeep surprisingly didn't mention the word money. I mean, it's replete in his book, but in his presentation today, there's one thing that he didn't talk about. And, I mean, this is an extremely expensive election. It's an election which saw very innovative ways of fundraising and very brazen ways of fun expenditure. Not the earlier kind of saying, I'll send a bottle of booze to your house or 500 rupees a la the famous DMK, AI, DMK mode or the promising of freebies. But there is a huge amount of expenditure in the creation of images, all right, and in the investments in technology which can help create the images. All right. All right. I think we just look at advertising money 
It's, it's quite amazing. And again, what implications it will have for the nature of Indian politics is something which is worthwhile to think of. The fifth point that I'd like to make is that Rajdeep talked about an incredible strike rate of 282 out of 350. And it's always interesting for us to ask as to why is it that in the other 200 seats, the BJP was not doing so well. Here is an image, you had all the same advantages of a declining Congress, a weakening economy, the desire for a strong leader who's tech savvy, who communicates, etc., 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 etc. Why does it not work in certain areas? Does it not work because there are pre-existing organizations? Does it not work because the conditions there are different? All right. Now, one can always say that east of Kanpur, when you get into Bihar, when you get further down, you know, we've always seen a kind of dividing line, north-south between west of Kanpur and east of Kanpur. You say conditions there are very different. But when we look at the south, right, what makes conditions there different? Is it the nature of the organization, etc., etc.? And I'm saying that this is something which requires somewhat deeper study. Uh, remember one of the persons that uh, Rajdeep quotes and has relied on often uh, when we talk of the CSDS post poll surveys, etc., etc. I mean, if you look at Yogen's writing on elections in terms of the first electoral system, the second electoral system, I mean, he was five, six years back, uh, you know, willing to relook at this notion of the role of the regional parties. All right. And unfortunately, you know, we start doing system characterizations based on every result that we get. So is the regional party over? No, but the regional party is back. You know, and I'm saying that in doing it, it's nice for a newspaper op-ed article. But in terms of trying to understand the shifts in the nature of Indian politics, I think we require to go a little deeper. What's my final take? I'm saying that The election does signal a range of things. Uh, amongst the things that it does signal is the possible demise of a 100-year-plus old party and its implications for this country, uh, even in electoral terms, as Mr. Modi and his cohorts discovered, much to their dismay in Delhi, that a Congress Mukt Bharat doesn't necessarily mean BJP supremacy. All right. The second thing is the shifts in the language of politics. This thing about governance, the things about what kind of weightage we give to the idea of wealth and opportunity. Uh, are we moving to a politics in which the language is that of job creation? Or are we in a thing of subsidies? Or are we in a thing of creating opportunities within which people can make wealth? And I'm saying each of them have very different implications, not just for post-election politics, but also in terms of the manner within which we are communicating to the kinds of people that we are communicating with. Uh, my final point, uh, I agree with Rajdeep that the last close to one year of Mr. Modi uh, leaves everyone a little confounded. Your, everybody is very excited with his energy, etc., etc., uh, a little worried with the nature of hubris, with the nature of centralization, with the inability for policies to move in the manner that we think that policies ought to move. Uh, I think that Mr. Modi, despite his many years as a state chief minister, still has to understand that the rhetoric of winning elections and the rhetoric of governing are two different things. And often the kind of promises, the kind of rhetoric, the kind of demonization that we do in the nature of our electoral discourse actually makes life that much more difficult for us. And this is a thing that politicians in countries which don't have stable rules and laws, in which politicians qua politicians don't matter that much because large numbers, large amount of the country, large amount of the business of the country can operate quite automatically. That is not true for countries like India. Leadership 
matters. The direction that you give to state bureaucracies matter. All right. I think politicians need to learn how to be more careful. And I think this is a lesson that possibly Mr. Modi will learn. Uh, whether the daily elections are an appropriate indication for him to do so or not, I don't know. I think, again, like with 2014, we tend to overread 2015. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Different sets of voters played a very big role in Mr. Modi's campaign in 2014. Uh, while the economic decline couldn't have pleased you, the fact that the economic issues were at the fore must have pleased you. Well, I think that um, in, in, uh, the way that I'm going to put this is that it's really too <coughs> early in many ways to work out exactly how bad the economy was leading up to uh, Mr. Modi's victory. Until we have a clearer idea of who was benefiting and who was suffering from this uh, slowdown that we saw from 20, you know, essentially after 2008, but in effect after 2011, we're not going to be able to come up with any proper theory, I think, of what the impact of the economic slowdown was on voting patterns. And the reason that I want to sort of stress this is because on, at some level, sitting in Delhi during the course of that slowdown, we saw that there was a government that appeared to be doing nothing. But political scientists, and, and therefore obviously this is going to upset people whose uh, pocketbook it is affecting. Political scientists, however, have never really believed that people vote on everybody's income. They believe that they vote on their specific income. And there is at least some body of literature that seems to bear this out empirically. The question is, did this, was this not the case in the last election? There is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 some surveys that have been carried out in 2014 um, suggest that people, even if they had themselves benefited over the course of UPA2, nevertheless saw the economy as a major, you know, the death of the economy as a major issue. Now this goes, you know, flies in the face of the existing rhetoric of, of you know, democratic policy. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? You know, it is not about how you yourself have done, but how the economy as a whole has done. Then we get into questions of, did the economy in fact um, you know, was it was it recovering maybe a year, year and a half before the 2014 election, as new GDP data se seems to suggest? If so, then we have to then again question this entire story of the economic slowdown being primary in many ways. Finally, you know, Chidambaram, J.R. Ramesh, many of the sort of uh, hefty economic hitters in the Congress party like to blame inflation for being, uh, uh, you know, the root cause of, you know, it's like, and this has always been the standard Indian uh, thing. Agar inflation here, so that means that the incumbent government is obviously going to lose. That has always been, you know, the claim since, you know, since, since the 60s. Um, but what happens if, as was the case in UPA too, um, high inflation nevertheless was significantly lower than the increases in purchasing power in real incomes um, across many parts of the country that subsequently voted for Narendra Modi. So there are, when one looks at the primacy of, of the economy and the slowing economy in, a, a, as an electoral issue, there are nevertheless some very, very major open questions that I think we're going to have to look at through granular economic versus political data. Nevertheless, um, to return to the question of does it matter that the economy was discussed, well, I think that for, uh, uh, in many ways, in 1989 as well, you know, in many other wave elections, uh, um, the economy has been something that is talked about without being talked about. I, I, my, 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 my supposition, and I'm up to being corrected by people who, who, who lived through it, uh, was that 1989, uh, when people were talking in UP about uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi being a chore, the subtext was he has taken your money and you are worse off for it. They were referring to the drought of 87, was it 87 or 88? Huh? 87. 87. They were referring to the drought of 87, you know, and, and the distinct difference in people's uh, 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 lifestyles 
in 86 and 88, therefore, as, um, you know, and blaming it on theft. And I think that there was a way in which we saw something similar being the nature of the narrative, not just from Mr. Modi, but especially from Mr. Kejriwal in, 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 in the past couple of years. So I would say that if there is, if, if, if you're going to bring together this sort of paradox that maybe people who actually did found themselves better off because of UPA2 or during UPA2, nevertheless blaming UPA2 for a bad economy, with um, uh, you know, uh, with, with, the, with the number of, uh, of seats that Mr. Mr. Modi got, I think we have to start looking at what Harsh allu uh, alluded to, which is the, the idea that it isn't purely about your pocketbook, that economic issues can be about more than what you yourself have earned. And economic, and, and this sort of dividing line between economic issues and Hindutva or cultural majoritarianism that you suggest is not, in fact, as sharp as 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 uh, you sort of seem to suggest in your initial presentation. Um, I think that what my my idea and what I've always been saying is that Mr. Modi has a very clear idea of what he wants India to be, and that is the idea that he has sold, and it is an India that is strong, rich, and Hindu. And in his world, and in the world of many of his voters. Those are not three different things. Those are interconnected things. Those are the same thing. Those, are, those things support each other. You cannot be strong without being Hindu. You cannot be rich without being strong. You cannot be strong without being rich, and so on and so forth. You know, the rhetoric of one supports the other. So it is not as if these are three different things that he's playing to. Um, how does this play out in the actual fact of the rhetoric? Well, I think that my amazement has always been in this idea uh, that Mr. Modi has somehow created this division between two different concepts. Like, uh, 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 there's an opposition between governance and vote bank politics. The politics of governance necessarily means that you cannot have the, poli you know, play vote bank politics. If you play vote bank politics, that means that you cannot possibly be, you know, doing the politics of governance. Governance is bad if, if you are a vote bank part. Now, this, if you sit and think about it for a moment, actually doesn't make much sense. There is absolutely no reason why you cannot be an efficient administrator while simultaneously targeting things towards specific ethnic groups. These are two different concepts. Yet, I think incredibly over the past four years, we have, and probably helped by the fact that the Congress was both inefficient and, you know, uh, uh, a party of vote bank politics, Mr. Modi has demonstrated that he has been able to convince 80% of the country that one necessarily implies the absence of the other and vice versa. And what does this actually mean? This goes exactly what I'm, to what I'm saying, that to be a Hindu party or a Hindu state and to be a strong state and to be a well-governed and therefore rich state all requires Mr. Modi to do the same, you know, uh, according to Mr. Modi means that India will have to be Hindu, rich and strong, fix, find policies that are Hindu, find policies that are pro-rich, you know, not pro-rich, but, you know, help India to become rich and find policies that will help India to become strong in the international arena. And these are all three the same thing. And, in fact, you have referred to this in a sort of uh, uh, interesting way where you say that um, uh, India as a first, uh, uh, this unique historical moment um, sat along with fascination with wealth, sat alongside nationalism and consumer culture, and a desire to see India as a first world economy. That's what created conditions for the India phenomenon. He promised wealth, uber nationalism, and access to quality public goods. And that is exactly right. He promised all three of them simultaneously and through one message. So that's the intriguing aspect of it, and I think that's, that's what Hirsch's point three was all about. So is it that I'm happy that economic issues were talked about? Well, yes, to a certain extent. My real concern was that for a presidential issue, for a presidential uh, uh, election, it, they weren't talked about enough in the sense that he was talking about economics, but none of us wanted to question him about economics. You know, the media did not want to specifically talk to him about what his plan would be, or for that matter, did not specific, specifically want to question any of his opponents. So 
in presidential elections, what happens? You have two candidates to stand up and say, okay, this is what we are going to do when we are president. Then the, and, and, and frequently what they present as their plans are incredibly detailed. You question them on their plans. I mean, it was incredibly boring for some of us in 2008 when we just wanted to, you know, see the nice optics of Hillary versus Obama to, to discover that the actual debates were endlessly about the nature of single player, a single player health plans versus can you get the health insurance industry involved? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To someone sitting in India, that was boring when you clearly had, you know, this incredibly rhetorically uh, uh, interesting election. However, what was the product of that? The product of that was that you had a, a, a president who came in who was very, very clear about what he was elected to do. You had a set of people who were very, very clear about what the president was likely to do about economic policy. Did we have any of that when Mr. Modi came in on May, May the 17th? No, we did not. Are we suffering because of that? Yes, we are. We have now a, a, a prime minister who came in and was very effective and very efficient in many ways, but did not have in that year leading up to becoming prime minister, the kind of policy discussion that would have enabled him to hit the ground running. Which is why we now have one year in are wondering what the hell is happening. That's because Mr. Modi is learning on the job as prime minister, whereas had it been a genuine presidential election, he would have been able to learn all the way in. Okay, and um, so that's, that's my sort of broad point on the economics. I just want to address two more things, which is um, the last word on the, co the Congress. I mean, one of the important things that you need um, when you are trying to make a structural, to go through some kind of structural transformation is the people who tell you when you're getting it right and when you're getting it wrong. And that's usually the role that an opposition plays. Mr. Modi does not have an opposition. Regardless of whatever the Rajya Sabha may be, you know, pretending to do right now, he does not have a coherent and effective opposition taking him on on specific points. And there's a reason for that. There's a re and the reason is the Congress in particular has no dashed idea what it actually means or what it actually stands for. All right. Um, Jairam Ramesh says, you know, we want to, you know, we are a party of inclusion. Fine. What, you know, rather than a party of the individual, that's, that's, that's another lovely quote that, that Rajiv has, has found. But what does that mean if you're a party of opposition? Look at this question of the land acquisition bill. All right. In actual fact, there are two aspects to this land acquisition ordinance that we're, we're having to suffer through. And in one of them, the BJP has made the, 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 the process of land acquisition far more inclusive. Now, an honest opposition party, all right, the kind that maybe the Congress should, should at least try to be, would say, this is what you're doing that, this is, that is bad, this is what you're doing that is good, and thereby the Congress could perhaps recover some of the credibility on policy issues that it has massively lost over the past five years. But the Congress is not being honest. And it is not being honest because it is not able to recognize that it suffers from a credibility deficit. And that is first priority must be to recover that credibility deficit. I don't, you know, in, in many ways, the Congress did not lose, was not dead um, on May the 17th. All right, it was not, on May the 17th, you couldn't necessarily have said, this was a party, this is the, this is the, the end of the road for a 100-year-old party. Nine months after May the 17th, you can see it far more authoritatively because it is it has been become absolutely clear that these chaps have no plan for the future. They have no plan for themselves. They have no plan for the future of their voters. They have no plan for the future of their country. They're not even working on it. So we don't have an opposition. So which leads me actually to the actually to the final point. Um, why is it that Mr. You say that you know, what happened in those other two hundred constituencies? What happened in those other two hundred constituencies was that people who knew Mr. Who Mr. Modi was people uh, did not believe that the uh, voting for Mr. Modi was anything but a wasted vote. May not have believed this. In spite of that, in the ward in which I grew up. Uh, which is in Calcutta South, and you know, uh, a, a, a kilometer away from Mamata Banerjee's house, the BJP won. All right, um, in a place where it has not, it had not been competitive for for decades. I mean, Ashok can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's never been competitive there. So yes, it did not win those 200 seats. It may win 50 of those 200 seats in the next um, election, because not just because of the decline of the Congress, but because of the sense in which India itself is changing these economic issues slash cultural issues 
have a pan-India appeal, and Mr. Modi is the one person who's able to to take advantage of that. So I think that that's broadly what I wanted to say. Well put, Mehir. Thank you. Uh, thank you for both agreeing with my initial remarks and then disagreeing with them. <laughs> uh, we now move to Dr. Manoj Joshi. Uh, Manoj, you will no, no doubt have a lot of worthy things to say about uh, the election of 2014. But among the other things you, you're going to tackle, I'd like you to place this election uh, in the context of India's position and positioning in the world and particularly in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ashok. Well, I'm here uh, primarily as a, as uh, a journalist who, in the past, has also covered many elections. Uh, I think six or seven by my count. But uh, and also started out um, as colleagues of Rajdeep uh, in the Times of India. And uh, the one thing which I've seen in elections is each election, in some way or the other, there's a little paradigm shift. It changes. What we are seeing now, of course, over time in India is that it's going back and forth. The paradigm is kind of, uh, the uh, you, you have tendency towards uh, reversions. I mean, you look at elections like 67, uh, 77, 1980, 1989, uh, 2004, 2014. So they're equally dramatic, meaning 77, for example, the Congress left lost every seat from Gujarat to Orissa in an arc. And you know, those are times when you didn't have TV, you didn't have anything, and um, uh, yet that happened. So I won't go into the complexity. The problem is we journalists have almost always got it wrong. I, mean, I remember in 1984, an election which the, the most spectacular victory of the uh, Congress. Um, or, of but anyone. It, uh, or, of or of anyone. But yet, uh, on the ground, if you look at the reportage, no one will tell you that the Congress is about to ha have this incredible victory. And I think the same Rajdeep will agree with me, 2014, meaning people said that BJP is winning, but no one but no one predicted the outcome to the extent that, uh, of the extent of the BJP's victory, especially the UP uh, outcome, which is absolutely uh, staggering. So I'm saying when you're looking for, for I think don't look for forecasts when you look for this. We are not particularly good for that. But I think what you will do uh, when you look at Raj, the book is pick up a lot of the way in which politics works from someone who's actually had a ringside seat. And I'm saying if you look at the insights that you get from the fact that Rajdeep knows many of the principal actors in this, uh, he's talking of Modi since 1990, uh, Mamta Banerjee has cooked him a meal, uh, you know, with the uh, Machir Jhol. These are kind of, uh, uh, this is the kind of um, impeccable access you get as a star anchor. And he's put it to good use in this book because uh, uh, the, 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 what you learn from this, uh, I think is more than just looking at the uh, election and the outcome and the cephology of the uh, outcome. And I think his uh, advantage, and I will say this again because I will, uh, have, uh, have been a print journalist, is that he started out as a print journalist. So he knows how to write. <laughs> he knows how to write. He's smooth. And uh, this is a well-written, uh, insightful book which picks up the main uh, issues that we're looking for. Because actually, if you look at the media scene, it's fairly disappointing. I mean, say if you look at the media after, let's say, the emergency, the, gro the, print, the, the, the golden age of the print media, between 1977 and 1989. But if you look at the TV today, you find that it's taken away the content and the focus. And Rajdeep himself describes this when he looks at some of his early rep uh, uh, earlier reportage as a journalist. And subsequently, when this whole question, I think he describes this as this, you know, the so-called breaking news uh, syndrome. Uh, we have actually reached a kind of an impasse uh, in this country, which um, becomes very difficult to kind of uh, go through certain TV channels and watch the news. And you have to actually go to Doordarshan to actually get an idea what the news of the uh, day is all about. And but I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now the thing is that uh, when you look at the, uh, we've looked at uh, the election itself, the factors that went behind the election. For that, I th will commend the book itself uh, to you. I can't describe you that. But what the point that everyone's asking is, what now? Now, Mr. Modi uh, has been in power. Uh, he's approaching the and the uh, first anniversary uh, of his uh, swearing in. The question is, what now? And I think what now is inextricably tied up with the Modi personality, meaning that focused, aggressive, control freak, a bit of a loner, an outlier. In in a peculiar way, he's managed to unite the opposition. 
meaning you have uh, you may say that the opposition has prayed the congress is nowhere but yet they've been standing like a rock in the rajya sabha and according to um, uh, an, i think analysis which was done by indian express uh, the bjp has no chance of uh, getting a majority in the rajya sabha till 2019 you know if they uh, so so what you mean is that the the majority this is a little bit of and mehir referred to american politics little bit of what's happening out there in the sense where the republicans have completely barracked the uh, democratic uh, president and promise <laughs> promise to do that uh, in the future uh, as well so now the question is you have mr modi the one thing you find uh, one peculiar thing you have he actually has no friends i mean amit shah is the closest to him but amit shah is not a friend Amit Shah is Murid, meaning you know he's a he's a follower, and he has no friends. He can't reach out. Many yes, they say that he has some kind of an equation with Sharad Pawar, but you know Sharad Pawar doesn't really matter in all this. Now this this uh, uh, becomes a problem when you come to the agenda, because when you look at the uh, agenda, and I'm struck by the fact that you have three countries in Asia. and as we come to my international relations hat you you have japan china and india all three countries are coincidentally having a parliament sessions and the theme of all three parliament sessions is reform how do we change our society we need structural change we need to move ahead uh, we need to do things so that uh, see in the case of japan we know what the problem is it is the whole long deflation so japan needs to do certain things break the lobbies the agricultural lobby the the bureaucrats lobby um, etc and then you have china in china you need to do what uh, you know you need to cope with what xi jinping has called the new normal that is low economic growth but a deliberately lower economic growth because you can no longer sustain the old style of high investment um, uh, economy so you need to get into an economy that is innovative and entrepreneurial which and 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 this has to be done uh, even while the communist party of china maintains its control uh, over that system and then you have of course india all of you are um, uh, residents here you are aware of the challenges that india faces the kind of reform we also need structural reform in the old days when a government changed uh, government lost the election new government came you were appointed minister you went to your ministry and more or less you carried on your work because uh, this was more or less routine you were not expected to you the minister were not expected to be an expert uh, in understanding the issues you basically the bureaucrats told you what to do and you uh, moved ahead but the challenge for every modi minister is that not only do you have to run your ministry you have to you can only run it if you reform and restructure it if you don't reform and restructure your ministry there's nothing to run I mean the ministries have been completely um, uh, tied up tangled up in red tape and all kinds of tape um, the, they, there are cross regulations the 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 ias led bureaucracy has created such a miasma of rules and regulations that the system doesn't work and so you the minister have to do all that you have to restructure your university uh, your ministry and i speak primarily from the ministry that i'm interested in uh, the defense ministry you know is an obvious case in point i can um, you know uh, tell you chapter and verse about the um, uh, issues out there but this is true of other ministries as well the problem however is that mr modi's ministers do they look to you like people who are capable of doing that yes mr modi himself can do it Mr Modi has the capacity but you look at the many ministers I won't name them because that will be unfair but a lot of them just do not seem to have that executive ability to understand the issues grasp the issues you know uh, and have the modi like ability if i may say so um, in uh, which to a great degree relies on instinct modi is an instinctual politician his 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 tour de force in his foreign policy in the last 8 um, months which i think has been extremely sure footing all around is not because he's got some key advisor somewhere he doesn't because we are i've asked around there are no advisors modi is running the show modi it's modi's instincts it's he who uh, want uh, reached out to barack obama and invited him to be chief guest in republic day he saw through he it's he who called the uh, insisted that all sark leaders uh, uh, attend his uh, swearing in over the uh, advice of the foreign ministry we didn't want that to happen so he's a brilliantly instinctive instinctive pop uh, uh, instinctive uh, uh, politician 
he's done very well um, uh, in this uh, in this plot, but he needs the team and the team doesn't seem to be going anywhere and as we have seen the reform efforts are not going uh, going anywhere the one country in which you see reform happening on, and, and reform steps taking place or corruption being fought is China. You find Xi Jinping gambling big. He's taken on some of the biggest figures. He's, he's uh, uh, I think the two members of the, um, the Central Military Commission, there's Chao Yong Kang, who was the former number three in the Chinese uh, Politburo Standing Committee, uh, who, who has been charged with corruption. So really big tigers have, have been uh, laid low in the, uh, in the system. In 2012, she, uh, the, the Chinese used to talk about creating a moderately well-off society. Uh, but the most recent Congress I noticed, uh, in the most uh, NPC uh, speech, uh, they are called for a well-off society. I mean, the difference between the moderately well-off and well-off, uh, they want a well-off society by 2020. And you can be sure with the sure-footedness and energy that the Chinese system has. I'm not an admirer of that system. There are a lot, whole lot of other problems. All I'm trying to say is that structural reform is required and it's, it's being provided for. Take corruption. This was an issue that shook this country, 2010, 2011, 2012, yet nothing is happening. But you just look at the anti-corruption campaign in China, big, big figures uh, uh, laid low. So my point is that, but you know, of course, the thing that one must remark is that the consequences of failure are the most severe for Mr. Xi himself. If the Chinese party fails, the Chinese Communist Party fails, the Chinese Communist Party system collapses, all of them will be on the dock and probably uh, serving long time uh, term in jail because yeah, we, if, if, if that's struck, no, I'm just saying that the challenge for the CPC is to keep that system going at top levels of efficiency. But you know that what will happen if Mr. Modi fails or Mr. Uh, uh, Shinzo Abe fails, you'll be back to square one. Japan goes back to deflation. India goes back to the Hindu rate of growth. Uh, we, we muddle along uh, uh, as we are. So, you know, in a sense, I'll say that many of us actually want Mr. Modi to succeed. But we are now worried that the factors in his personality that brought him to power where uh, so there is a certain sense amongst people who have been perforce forced to support him, maybe partly the RSS, partly sections of the BJP, the, the, the uh, certain elements of the opposition are suddenly finding that if Mr. Modi stumbles, they'll be the happiest. They'll be the happiest and they're, they're looking at uh, opportunities for that. But fortunately for Mr. Modi, uh, he has uh, an excellent insurance policy and that name of the insurance policy is Mr. Rahul Gandhi. Because <laughs> as long as uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi is in charge of the Congress, uh, you're simply not going to get the kind of resistance which would be able to uh, push the BJP um, back, you know, push the, uh, have a, some kind of a pushback to the Modi uh, phenomenon. So I'll just conclude here and... Uh, Thank you, Manoj. I'd just like to take issue with one point you said. While Mr. Modi may well have internal rivals in the RSS or in the Sangh Parivar who may want him to occasionally stumble, I don't think they fundamentally want him to fail. Because the RSS and the BJP realize that after 50 years of trying, they want a majority. And they know what that means. And they would want to retain that majority in 2019 as well. <laughs> Great. So I think this is the time basically to join me in um, thanking all the panelists and uh, a round of applause to Jagdeep.